Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Tracy Cook with SACS Healthcare Communications and I will be your webinar producer for today's webinar. Before I introduce our moderator and speakers on behalf of the GE Healthcare and SACS Communications, we want to thank all of the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping us all through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to you all. I would like to show our audience how to ask questions today. Please type your questions into the questions box and we will respond to as many as we can at the end of the session. Our moderator for today is Mary Rose Gaughan. Ms. Gaughan is a PhD student at the University of Buffalo. She is a member of American Nurses Association and serves on Connected Health, Telehealth Professional Issues Panel Advisory Committee. She has published articles in several peer-reviewed journals and has presented at medical conferences both in the U.S. and internationally. Mary Rose, welcome. Thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to GE Healthcare for providing support for this educational activity. The title of today's webinar is Early Detection of Patient Deterioration on General Care Floors, Instituting Effective Vital Signs Monitoring. We are very fortunate today to have two extremely qualified speakers today, and presenting on this very important and timely topic is Dr. Junquist and Dr. Josie. Our first, Josie. Our first speaker is Dr. Carla Junquist. She's an associate professor at the University of Buffalo School of Nursing and a nurse practitioner at Thompson Health Sleep Disorder Centers. Her research endeavors are directed at safe and effective pain management, in particular, the application of continuous electronic respiratory monitoring to improve patient safety. She is the lead writer of the American Society for Pain Management Nursing Clinical Practice Guidelines for identifying and monitoring patients at risk for opioid-induced respiratory depression. Dr. Joshi is Specialist Registrar at Ashford and St. Peter's Hospital in the KSS Deanery. She is Clinical Research Fellow in the Department of Surgery and Cancer at Imperial College London. She has recently completed a PhD on optimizing the identification of acute deterioration in sepsis through digital technology. Dr. Joshi has received several awards for her work, including the prestigious British Science Association Isambard Kingdom Brunei Award Lecture 2020, the Royal College of Surgeons England Research Fellowship, and winner of the London Surgical Symposium. She has peer-reviewed publications on wearable sensors and has been invited to present her work at several international meetings. Dr. Junquist and Dr. Joshi ain't disclosed no conflicts of interest associated with this presentation. There are continuing education for physicians and a link to obtain CEM credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. This activity is jointly provided by Synaptive and SACS Healthcare Communication, and there is an accreditation statement. Support for this educational activity is provided by GE Healthcare. For this educational activity is approved for one contact hour of CNE and CRCE. The accreditation um, statement is from SACS Healthcare Communication, and they are accredited as a provider for, for providing continuing education, and they are approved for one contact hour. So now we will start early detection of patient deterioration on general care floors, instituting effective instituting effective vital signs monitoring. Dr. Junquist. Thank you, Mary Rose, uh, for the introduction and thank um, GE for uh, providing the platform for us to do this talk. The uh, learning objectives, there we go, a little delay. The learning objectives uh, for this talk, um, so I, I'm going to start with reviewing the cost and consequences of undetected patient deterioration on the general care floor, and then we'll discuss the patterns of breathing often found during patient deterioration. The electronic monitoring devices available will be reviewed, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Joshi, uh, who'll discuss some research on the application of wireless monitoring on the general care floor. Um, well, 
you know, the reason we're doing this is to increase patient safety. Um, eight to nine percent of patients on the general care floor will experience deterioration that um, will end with the transfer to the ICU. And some of those, of course, uh, will result in death. Um, the costs are significant. Increased lengths of stay amount to between 3,000 and 38,000 per uh, patient stay, and that's in the U.S. Uh, patient harm and increased risks of nosocomial infections and opioid-induced uh, uh, sentinel events actually cost healthcare systems up to two and a half million per claim on average, and they really contribute to nurse burnout. So it's very important. Um, Using evidence-based strategies for continuous moni monitoring, there is some evidence that early detection uh, has decreased 30-day mortality, decreased length of stay, and for each hour of delay in recognition of patient deterioration, the risk of death increases by 1.5% and the risk of mortality increases by 1%. So early detection is very important. And Continuous vital signs monitoring has been shown to be effective in uh, guiding early detection. So now I want to talk about what does patient deterioration look like. Um, there are three main types of respiratory insufficiency that result in uh, arrest and, and patient harm. Um, the examples of these are um, the first one, uh, type 1, is uh, a rapidly evolving clinical cascade that's usually related to sepsis, CHF, aspiration, uh, pulmonary emboli, all involved with the microvascular. Early in the trajectory of this happening, you will see a rise in respiratory rate and a rise in minute ventilation. Um, unfortunately then, um, usually what would happen is as the, uh, the disease entity progresses, you'll see a decrease in CO2 and eventually a decrease in SpO2. The second type is opioid-induced respiratory depression, or CO2 necrosis, uh, from opioids. Uh, in this situation, you will see respiratory rate and minute ventilation really decrease, um, and that results in an increase in CO2 and then an eventual decrease in uh, uh, oxygen. You know, in, in the situation where you have supplemental oxygen, the decrease is going to be blunted um, to what is the accurate. So uh, unless the patient has a healthy arrest, arousal threshold, they are going to experience a very sudden respiratory arrest. The third type is, uh, of the pattern is what we see with sleep disordered breathing. Um, it looks similar to opioid-induced respiratory depression, but it's going to occur repeatedly. And then uh, as the night goes on, because this is usually during sleep, uh, um, this actually usually gets worse. So with a good arousal threshold, uh, patients will wake themselves to breathe. But in the setting of central nervous system depressants, such as we use often in the hospital, the arousal threshold will be less sensitive and the patient can exhibit a full arrest. Early detection of patient deterioration depends on accurate and continuous monitoring of ventilation. Um, so as you can see from the three patterns, Respiratory or oxygenation is one of the later signs of respiratory distress. 
So on the general care floor, we usually measure all these parameters. Um, although we collect all the data, the most sensitive measure of patient deterioration is really ventilation status. So now let me speak more about the normal values of these different parameters. And uh, But first, I want to go into the definition of uh, ventilation and how we can measure it compared to just oxygenation. So there are, um, well, to adequately assess for those three patterns of uh, rapidly evolving clinical uh, cascades, you will uh, assess ventilation as opposed to oxygenation. And the three ways, uh, three main ways um, of measuring um, ventilation are a combination of respiratory rate with oxygen saturation, uh, carbon dioxide, which there's two types now, end tidal and transcutaneous, and minute ventilation. And there are uh, devices that have been validated uh, and are clinically useful. I'll talk about them a little bit more, but first let me talk a little bit about what is normal. So um, respiratory rate, we can either uh, measure it with observation or electronically. Uh, but we have to remember what is really a normal pattern and that we need to measure it for at least 30 seconds, if not a full minute, to really tr uh, truly appreciate the uh, breaths per minute. So if the person is less than 65, the range is probably around 12 to 18, but during their sleep, it can go as high as 20. For adults 65 to 80, the upper value increases as high as 28, and for our elders, it could go as high as 30. But the rate could be rising or falling within that normal range of deterioration. So it's very important to accompany a measure of ventilation or oxygenation when we're measuring respiratory rate. Remember that changes over time can be accurately measured with continuous electronic monitoring, and any changes over time are best observed using the graphs within the device or within your electronic uh, health record. So as you know, oxygen pulse oximetry measures oxygen saturation. Normals usually range 95 to 100 uh, during wakefulness and are as low as 92 during sleep. But we all see numbers much outside this range uh, in, in people who are really very fully functional. The important observation um, is to assess change over time. I call this trend monitoring as opposed to threshold monitoring. If we were to use the cutoffs of sleep disordered breathing uh, in the literature, what we would say is that looking over time, if you're having uh, events of respiratory, of oxygen saturation less than uh, 90% for 10 seconds, trending over time, uh, or if you see a trend of a decrease of 3% from baseline, uh, that would be considered clinically relevant event. Uh, I'm considering you all know, I'm encouraging all of you to um, get away from threshold monitoring and move to trend monitoring. Now let me just say something about supplemental oxygen, as I mentioned before. This is a study I did in the PACU. We monitored patients with pulse oximetry and tidal CO2 and minute ventilation over the course of the PACU uh, stay. This a horizontal line is when they received an opioid dose. These solid lines are the thresholds that are considered normal, 90%, 50 uh, of a uh, end tidal CO2 and less than 40% of predicted for a minute ventilation. You will see this patient here, oxygenation doesn't move and it's because they're on supplemental oxygen. But you can see end tidal CO2 is climbing, 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 minute ventilation is decreasing with each addition of an opioid dose. 
in the same scenario in this situation, this person is really retaining CO2, oxygen saturation not moving. And again, they're on three liters of supplemental oxygen, minute ventilation declining. This is the same scenario, these different patients. Again, three doses. They have some hypoventilation, increasing CO2. Oxygen does nothing. But look at this person. All these doses of opioids, oxygenation doesn't move, and they just keep breathing wonderfully. They are somebody who's not sensitive to opioids' um, uh, respiratory depression effect, and they're probably somebody who would not need to be monitored near as close on the general care floor. So um, just to show you quickly here, um, these are two different versions of CO2 monitoring. This is a, a transcutaneous CO2 monitor. This has been used for years in infants and now is being validated and for use in adults. It's one little lead that's either on the cheek or on the earlobe. This is transcutaneous. We're pretty much all of us familiar with this. Real difficult time keeping this on somebody's face. In my study, the transcutaneous uh, monitor was much more acceptable um, by the patient. And then we have minute ventilation. Minute ventilation um, is reported on the percentage um, of predicted. So you, you enter in the patient's height, weight, gender, and they, uh, it's the uh, predicted men of ventilation uh, is then used by the device and it uh, will alarm if it goes down less than 40% of what should be normal for this patient. So in a way, this does trend monitoring. So just lastly, the cost can be a real obstacle to initiating continuous monitoring, but the research has shown that continuous monitoring can decrease ICU bed utilization, reduce nurse time measuring vital signs by hand, uh, reduce liability costs, reduce lengths of stay, and also uh, reduce direct costs uh, to the patient in the range of 224 to 710 um, per patient per year. So now uh, let me hand this off to, to Dr. Uh, Joshi, who's really going to talk about the feasibility of using uh, wireless monitoring that may be more acceptable to the patient and tether the patient to the bed less. Thank you very much, Dr. Drinkvist, and to GE for giving me the opportunity to have this talk. So, I've recently completed my PhD thesis on optimizing the identification of acute deterioration and sepsis through digital technologies. And this work was completed at Imperial College London under the guidance of Professor Aradazi, Professor Graham Cook and Professor um, Dr. Sadia Khan. And we're focusing on this failure to recognize patient deterioration, which is a ma major cause of morbidity and mortality. And at least 40% of intensive care unit admissions from the wards are referred late. So one of the biggest causes of patient deterioration is sepsis. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition that arises when the body's organ response to an infection injures its own tissues and organs. It affects 18 million worldwide every year. And in the UK alone, there are 245,000 cases of sepsis a year although this is likely to be an underestimate, as many patients can be coded with other disease pathologies, such as a pneumonia instead. As well as the hospital admission, sepsis causes major morbidity to patients, with 40% of sepsis survivors suffering permanent life-changing effects. The mortality of sepsis is as high as one in four, and we know that for every hour's delay, the mortality increases by 8%. This is really key as every hour makes a big difference and it's a common cause of patient deterioration. In the United Kingdom, we use the National Early Warning School. So up until um, 2012, the acute care from one hospital varied significantly to the other. And a way of standardizing this care was through the National Early Warning School that was later called News 2. 
And this is an objective measure of illness severity and outcome and is used in all adult patients across the United Kingdom. This is an example of a news chart, which is an aggregate score. And apologies, it's quite small, but what I'm trying to show is that there's in the blue column, there's breathing, circulation, pulse, temperature, disability. And the higher the score, the greater the risk to the patient. It also affects the level of monitoring that we have. So a news of one to four results in four to six hour observations. If the patient has a news of five to seven, this can result in hourly observations. And a news greater than seven needs continuous monitoring on the wards. So ultimately, the patient safety challenge is twofold, requiring earlier detection of deteriorating patients and needing a better escalation response. We know that we are still missing these patients and we're trying to see if new technologies can improve care and patient safety. So we've been looking at the literature and wondered whether intermittent digital alerts through electronic health systems such as CERNA and EGPIC could improve outcomes, certainly in sepsis. So we performed a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at these outcomes. So this is a Prisma flowchart of our studies. And initially we started with 4,000 studies, um, but when we took out, when we deduplicated and took out um, those that where the outcomes weren't measured, we were left with 16 studies for our meta-analysis. The results show that hospital length of stay reduced by 1.3 days in the alerting group. In addition to this, the intensive care unit length of stay reduced by 0.76 days. And this is just through intermittent alerting through electronic health records. We also found a reduction in mortality by 11.4% and a time to antibi antibiotic reduction by 126 minutes, although these two were not significant. So this led us to the hypothesis of considering more continuous monitoring. And whilst we have that ability in the intensive care unit, this is not always possible in the ward setting. So we've been looking at new technologies and wearable sensors that are able to provide more continuous monitoring to see if we can indeed detect patient deterioration and sepsis quicker than current methods. We explored um, a variety of several wearable sensor companies, and these were based on several different models. There's been an explosion in new devices in the literature recently, and this has mainly been due to improved miniaturization, a reduction in cost, wireless sensors that have a longer battery life. There's a whole host of sensor companies that I met in the first year of my PhD thesis, and these varied in the types of monitoring that they offered. So on the left, there's the early sense sensor, and this was a sensor device which is placed under the patient's mattress, and it measures heart rate, respiratory rate, and movement. Other sensors can be on the upper arm, a bit like a blood pressure cuff, or disposable sensors that can be placed on a patient's chest or forehead. The sensor that we used for this work was a lightweight wearable sensor that was placed on the patient's chest via ECG dots. And this sensor measures heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature. It's a disposable sensor with a low cost and a waterproof sensor with a five-day battery life. Once the strip is pulled and the sensor is activated, data from the sensor through radio frequency goes to a link bridge before it goes up to a virtual server. And then this data can then be transmitted either to an, a desktop computer or a mobile smartphone device. So the first um, important step in this work was really to assess the reliability of this sensor platform and compare it to current monitoring. So we performed a prospective study at West Middlesex University Hospital, which is an acute care hospital located not too far from Heathrow in the United Kingdom. It has over 400 beds and is a busy district general hospital. The inclusion for the study was anyone that was able to consent that we thought would stay in hospital for at least 24 hours. And this was dictated to by the clinical team. So every morning, the research team would meet the um, medical and surgical attendings to have a list of patients 
for that day and these would be approached by the research team and once we had consent the, the sensor was able to go live and we were able to compare data from the sensor to standard normal bedside observations that were also occurring as part of the integration of wearable technology we did we required a big campaign um, and this is going beyond the hospital magazine. And it's really important that everyone, whenever we're using new technologies in the hospital setting, knows about the technologies that we're using. In addition, we needed to make sure that all of our healthcare staff were trained to be able to use the devices, but also to know what to do if for any reason the sensors came off and had to replace them. This is a schematic of our acute medical unit, which is a 49 bedded unit. And we need the asterisks represent the bridges that were fitted on the unit so that wherever the patient is, data could be uploaded in real time. As well as our acute medical unit, we um, engineered our surgical unit as well as four other busy surgical floors. We collected a whole host of patient data, so everything about the patient demographic, but also everything about that admission, questionnaire data, and important information on sepsis, where the source was, the risk, whether or not they were on antibiotics, as well as biochemical tests such as white cell count, C-reactive protein. A significant part of this work was analysing or sensor data processing. Um, apologies, I don't have control of, a, of an arrow to be able to, sh to show this clearly, but in the first column there's date, second column time, heart rate, respiratory rate and temperature. And this is how the data was coming through to us. If for any reason the data was corrupt, there was an algorithm that was built into the sensor that would report that data as a minus one reading so that this wasn't analysed. And what we did is looked at several different averaging methods of comparing the sensor data to the ward data so in column 11, M and N, that was the ward data inputted. And what we really didn't know, what there wasn't a gold standard, was, was although that the, the ward nurses recorded the data as being inputted at two o'clock, actually the, the actual time that the reading was taken may have been a few minutes before or a few minutes after that time. And so what we were really looking at is averaging that data and looking at several different time windows to perform our comparison. So data analysis methodologies, um, as reported in the literature previously, we've been using Pearson correlation coefficients and Blant-Holtman plot representation. And much of this analysis is ongoing at the moment, um, and we are due to have this done um, uh, much of this analysis is ongoing at the moment, but we are due to have this um, perform soon. So here I'm able to share some of the results of our work. This was a 500 patient study and we were able to um, recruit a wide range of demographics based on the demographics uh, um, of the population around the hospital. So in total we had 292 white British patients and uh, a whole range of other ethnicities for this group leading a total of 500 patients for this study. So this is a schematic comparing medical and surgical patients and this is to say that roughly we had a 50-50 split between both medical and surgical patients. The medical patients are in, in blue and the surgical patients are in pink. And although I'm not able to, um, although the analysis is still ongoing at the moment, we certainly have very good reliability for heart rate and respiratory rate and this is work that's due to be published soon. As well as looking at the reliability of this work, we also wanted to look at the speed of detection. And our aim was really to compare continuous monitoring to current methods to really see if we could detect patient deterioration and sepsis quicker than current methods. And we compared sensor data to ward observation data. So this is an example um, of one of our patients that showed real time deterioration. On the left of the screen, I'm sorry it's small, um, font, but we could see a sudden cha colour change in accordance with the new score and suddenly um, you can see a column that's pink and that's C and this was at seven o'clock. Um, this, this model was created by Mr McAndrew who's our um, digital lead analyst at uh, Chelsea Westminster Hospital 
And he created this model. And we could see from this that the alert would have been generated on the sensor a whole three hours and eight minutes quicker for heart rate and two and a half hours quicker for respiratory rate. So we could see that in real time, we were certainly picking these patients up significantly quicker to standard monitoring on the wards. And this is just one example of this, but we have several that we're analyzing at the moment. Again, in the context of sepsis, these several hours difference can make life-changing effects to patients. As well as this, I performed patient interviews and questionnaires with the help of um, our psychologist, Dr. Stephanie Archer, and we performed quantitative and qualitative review of wearable sensors through questionnaire and interview studies. So the inclusion criteria were all participants that were wearing the sensor or enrolled in the study, and we also had a subgroup of patients that were selected for patient interviews. Anyone that was unable to consent or withdrew their consent um, was not eligible for the study, but this did not occur for any of our patients. So for our total 500 patients, we had questionnaire data from 453 patients. And I'm very pleased to say that 85% felt that the sensor was comfortable to wear. They did not find the system to be very complicated and nearly 89% understood why they were wearing the sensor. Interestingly, even though the sensor wasn't alerting in real time, nearly 70% of patients felt safer wearing the sensor. They knew who to contact and nearly 86% of patients would wear the patch again when in hospital. Patients didn't find the system particularly cumbersome to wear and nearly 80% would wear the sensor at home if it was available. Also, it was a very simple device and patients didn't have to learn a lot of things before they got going with it. As well as this, we performed um, 12 patient um, semi-structured interviews, and these were helped to provide in-depth feedback from our patients. What I'm very pleased to say is that all of the patients really welcomed the technology. Most of them had forgotten that they had the sensor on. They really felt the technology was coming to help with health issues, and it caused very little hindrance to normal function. Occasionally, they had to take extra care, certainly when in the shower or getting dressed, but feedback overall was that they felt very impressed and they actually felt there was an extra safety blanket around them. They felt that the machine reacted quicker to um, the nurses on the ward. Um, in terms of the negatives of the device, it was really one of the patients wanted to know a bit more about the data security. And I think there were a few questions on alert fatigue for the nurses if the um, sensors were going off repeatedly. As well as this, we were able to perform staff interviews and we had a, a mixture of very junior staff to senior staff, so junior nurses, doctors and senior nurses and consultants. Overall, all, all of the staff welcomed the technology. The surgical attendings really thought that this was ne the next best thing and would really improve care for patients. And it's really important for them because they were often monitored at several or covering several sites. And so actually having the ability to look at vital signs remotely was really important. The senior matrons and nurses really felt that this technology would help them out of hours, especially overnights and at weekends. The junior do doctors felt that this would certainly help pick up deterioration. And these are often the first that attend the scene when a patient deteriorates. And the junior nurses really felt that this would be a better way of relaying information to the doctor. So this was all in hospital, but as we know earlier on this year, COVID struck us all. And what we were trying to do is consider taking what we'd learned from hospital and applying it to a more remote setting, such as a hotel. And this, was, and this research was performed by one of my colleagues, Dr. Fahad Iqbal. So the sensor was the same one that we used in hospital. And we were really looking at, again, reliability, alerting, and also patient and staff feedback. So this is very much a proof of concept feasibility study. And we were based at several types, several hotels around Heathrow Airport. These hotels had nursing staff available, London ambulance, security, and had virtual access to GPs 24 seven. We were looking at arrivals um, to the UK with mild COVID symptoms and also symptomatic healthcare staff that were unable to isolate at home. Our only exclusion criteria were those that required a pacemaker. The duration of isolation varied as based on government guidelines and swab results. But our outcomes of interest were number of alerts generated and systems usability.
the hotel was very much set up like um, the hospital setting with the bridges applied per room. This allowed for communication from the centre and we had a central monitoring hub with nurses, porters and security. Alerts were based on the same national early warning score alerts that we used in our hotel setting. So with the results of this showed that we recruited 14 patients or participants into the study and we had 10 vital sign alerts in four patients. This, two of them were actioned with an abnormal temperature and an abnormal respiratory rate and two were left unactioned. There were no individuals that required hospitalisation or virtual GP review. Overall, the guests wearing the sensor perceived the sensor to be comfortable, they felt safer and less anxious and would also wear the sensor at home if available. Staff also felt that the technology was trustworthy, unburdensome and improved the, care, the level of care delivered to participants in the hotel rooms. So this was very much a feasibility proof of concept of a rapidly implemented model of healthcare delivery with a reduction of um, viral exposure to staff, allowing greater monitoring of participants and was well received by staff and guests alike. This was a very small si sample size, but we're hoping to build on this work for the future. I'd like to thank all of my team of supervisors, the sponsors of this work, the Royal College of Surgeons, CW Plus, Imperial College London and Chelsea Westminster. This wouldn't have been possible without the work of Ian Bryant, the lead IT at Chelsea, as well as Kenny McAndrew, our statisticians and our, the rest of our research team. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for GE. Um, and I'd like to move on um, to, we're able to ask further questions and I'll pass on to our moderator, Mary Rose. Thank you both for this excellent um, presentation. We have received numerous, we have received numerous questions from the audience, but before we get to the questions, I'd like to tell people, well, we've already discussed this about the continuing education. So I'd like to go to the first question. Could you please clarify COT necrosis? Does the presenter mean CO2 narcosis? Absolutely, that's what I meant. Sorry for misspeaking. The next question is, can you clarify what you mean by sentinel events during op with opioids? Well, sentinel events is what I mean is an event that caused patient harm or death. Um, and, and that would be uh, probably some lingo from the United States uh, in, in magnet hospitals uh, uh, talk about sentinel events. So it's just a term that means patient harm, an event that caused patient harm or death. Next question, how often are the sensors changed? Can they be removed and replaced on the same patient for daily care purposes? Um, does this maintain reliability? Thank you, so the, the sensors are actually um, replaced every five days and they're disposable devices. The average length of stay for most acute patients is often three to four days in hospitals. So most of our patients in our study only required one sensor. This is a very good question. I work on a unit that does not necessarily have to worry about sepsis, but we do have patients on PCA pumps receiving some sort of opioid. We are currently using safety checks either every two or every four hours, monitoring how much drug was delivered to the patient, respiratory rate and SpO2 saturation, as well as pain level. Do you recommend monitoring or checking for anything else to make sure that the patient does not go into opioid-induced respiratory rest or detect it as it soon as possible? Uh, thanks, Mary Rose. That's it. That is a really good question. So the um, American Society for Pain Management Nursing uh, published uh, monitoring guidelines, uh, and I, I'm sure they would apply uh, over the pond in the UK also. But what it basically says is that you have to measure respiratory rate, a measure of ventilation, so it would be respiratory rate and oxygenation, or CO2, or a minute ventilation at uh, baseline at peak effect and uh, when you have a PCA it is how you know when peak effect is because you don't know when the patient has pushed the button so it's really important to have them on continuous monitoring and there have been studies that show that continuous monitoring with PCA use really improves patient safety and decreases adverse events so if if you're doing intermittent monitoring you better be measuring um, level of consciousness also <laughs> 
Thank you. Here's the next question. Is the sensor compatible with other monitors and pacemakers? Yeah, really good question. So the sensor that we used was compatible with pacemakers and we were able to use it with other monitors too. So um, several of our patients that were on cardiac wards, um, especially the acute medical patients, um, also had additional forms of monitoring at the time and it was no problem. That's another good question. Who monitors variances in vital signs and how often? Was there a place in the electronic charting system to chart the change and alert the caregiver? So a lot of the work that we were doing was based on um, we weren't alerting in real time because we really thought that if we alerted, that would affect the reliability of our study, but we wouldn't really be able to look at a speed of detection. In the second phase of our work, so we've now done a study with another 160 patients, and in this, all of the caregivers were given a smartphone device, so they were getting real-time alerts because much of the work that we were doing previously was to develop the algorithms that we could be used. So it's not just the technology itself, it's providing meaningful packets of data to the nurses and also not bombarding them every time the sensor went off. So we were looking at a range of data values um, to portray that data and it was only if those thresholds were hit that then that would trigger an alert to the nursing team. Okay, the next question, was this tested in the obstetrical areas at all? Um, no, we we very fortunate actually. We had a lot of interest in uh, a lot of different specialties. So this this work is growing as we speak, but yet to test it in the obstetric setting. Um, for patients who had hair on their chest, did you have to shave them first? Uh, yes, uh, we did just for the uh, ECG dots, um, and most of the time they won't really had any problems with it. They actually, yeah, some people quite liked. Having, having the hair shaved off the chest. Okay. And, and Mary Rose, let me uh, talk about um, one of the studies that you and I actually uh, participated in and um, in the PACU. And the monitors, if they aren't, the leads aren't sticking, you're going to get a lot more alarms. So it's best to, to do a cool clipping. I don't know about shaving. Shaving is sort of passe at this point. Um, but, t you know, taking the scissors and, and cutting the longer hair off um, is really important, especially um, the minute ventilation monitor that we used. Those leads were bigger and they were really sensitive to um, hair. So if, if it's significant hair, we would just take a pair of scissors and, and clip it off. I should also say as part of our routine, patients um, had an ECG. So actually the, the hair removal was already done prior and we were using the same ECG dots in, in a similar position. So I, it didn't really make too much of a difference. Are the sensors safe for MRIs? Do they interfere with the clarity of x-rays? So we took, for anyone that was having the for an MRI, we took the sensor off just to, just to be cautious of everything. So based on the, the engineering of the, the wards, the sensors were mainly working in the ward setting. So if patients, and it's also an added security feature, so that if, for example, anyone went home with that sensor, it would only work within, a, within the vicinity of the bridges. And this was really a, a security thing as well. Um, for data security. So anyone that was going for any imaging, the sensor was removed. Interestingly, if they were going for imaging, say an ultrasound scan that didn't require uh, an MRI, for example, then as soon as they entered the ward again, their vital signs would have got uploaded. So for three hours, we at least had the data on the sensor. So as soon as they became within the vicinity of the bridge, that, that data was uploaded in real time. But really good question. Dr. Joshi, um, can you uh, elaborate just a, a little bit more on putting the, pat, the uh, sensor back on? Could you use the same sensor or did you have to get a new sensor? Yeah, absolutely. So the sensor has a unique barcode that's affiliated to that patient. And if often if they'd just gone for a scan that was a couple of hours, that um, sensor was removed by the nurse looking after the patient and left at the patient's bedside. Um, we did actually have one instance where the patient was um, went to radiology with the sensor and they just took it off at, at, the, at the unit. And I think that's why it's really important to have a, a hospital-wide um, implementation and every uh, sort of uh, 
through the intranet and the hospital magazine. So everyone really knew what we was we were doing and they weren't too surprised when they saw the devices. Here's another good question. Can you elaborate on what you mean by sentinel events in regards to opioids? So I don't know the specific question. I did just define what a sentinel event is, but um, on one of the slides I spoke about the cost of a sentinel event if it goes to into the legal system. And, and uh, again, that's a point where there's patient harm or death. Does the monitor presented by Dr. Um, Joshi have the capabilities of evaluating VE and or CO2? Sadly, not at the moment. So it was just looking at predominantly heart rate, respiratory rate and temperature. Um, but we are looking at uh, adding different modalities to it at the minute. I know that some of the um, devices on the market that are now available in the United States, um, there is one that can measure temperature, pulse oximetry, um, so oxygen saturation, uh, pulse and respiratory rate. Um, but uh, again, it's not widely available and uh, getting the software to integrate with uh, electronic health records, I'm sure is the next challenge that that company has. Um, it, it, was there a problem with you integrating into the health records in the UK? No, so luckily, um, initially when we did, did our study, we had paper-based charts for the vital signs at least, and other parts of monitoring on electronic health records. So we, um, at West Middlesex now, there's um, Cerner, which is one of the EHRs that we're using there. Um, and this device company had no problems at all integrating. Um, there's a lot of, there are several others that were meant looking at SpO2, and it would have been great to have that, but often it's a, it's a, like a little finger clip for patients, um, a bit like at the beds that we use for, for routine observations. And most of us are on our phones or using our hands. And actually, we felt that it would reduce the compliance of wearing sensors um, because most when we, we did small tests with various different sensors and healthy individuals before we went to the sensor that we were using. And a lot of people, it was fine for about half an hour or so, but you found that people were taking off these, certainly anything that looked like a SATS probe, because they're often quite clunky too. So it was it was a balance. I mean, our, our focus for this research was on sepsis. So the, the real big key that we were looking at was just as you've mentioned, Dr. Junk, Chris, with the importance of respiratory rate, um, temperature in the context of sepsis, and also heart rate, um, and these changing quite early on. They're asking about reliability when um, when the sensors are removed and replaced. We, we didn't really see any effects of removing or replacing them. It's very much a like-for-like -like barcode strip. Um, so uh, there, there were no, we, we didn't discover any problems with that. But good question. Um, it was more of occasionally patients had to have the um, ECG dots changed when certainly if they'd had a shower in the morning, but it's it's just standard ECG dots that people use for say an ECG, um, so it didn't cause us any problems. Okay, thank you both very much for answering them. We have we had a lot of really interesting questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but at this time Tracy has a few concluding remarks. Uh, my apologies. We'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open and we appreciate your feedback as well. You can find the CE Certificate of Completion in one hour following the conclusion of this webinar. You will receive an email with instructions and this link to obtain your credits at www.saxtexting.com backslash AD. And with that, we would like to thank everyone for attending today's session. And we'd also like to thank our speakers, the GE Healthcare, and the many people in audience today. This concludes our presentation.